needed this conference is was to be able to actually uh, accelerate progress so that we have a better chance of reaching STG six and consequently all of the STGs. Um, why was it particularly uh, in, important to have it at this moment in time? Well, the UN hasn't actually hadn't had a, con a, a conference on water in forty six years, so it was. Uh, overdue uh, to bring water at the heart of these discussions within the UN. The way that that happened is there is this uh, decade for action that was uh, established uh, about four or five years ago. There is actually, there was a, a decade for water previously. So this is the second decade uh, that is uh, dedicated to, to action for water. Um, and so the way that this was situated is that um, uh, Tajikistan and the Netherlands proposed that there be a moment in the middle of that decade, so at the halfway point, uh, to talk about how far that decade has actually been useful in, in accelerating action and where we still need to go. So that was the premise for having this midterm review of the decade for action. But then it actually blossomed into something much more important uh, uh, than that. Um, it was also this important moment to create political attention to prioritize water action. Because as we like to say in the water community, if you don't first address the water issues, then you won't be able to achieve the rest of the sustainable de uh, development agenda. Um, so it was a way also to confirm the global community's commitment to water issues in a proactive and action-oriented way. So um, through the, the, the fact that everyone showed up was, uh, was really important. It was the beginning of certain conversations that brought water to other sectors. So how is water important for climate change? How is water important for agriculture, for example? So it was an opportunity to pursue some of those conversations. Um, and also there was opportunity to talk about water, not only from a technical sp standpoint of providing services and pumps and pipes, but also to talk about soft measures, like about governance, about enabling environments for, uh, for uh, action to happen uh, and, uh, and people to be uh, empowered. So those were the reasons why it was important. Now, in terms of the, the, the general outcomes, um, I think that's on the, the next slide. Uh, there were over 10,000 people that attended. So uh, that includes member states, intergovernmental organizations, UN bodies. Uh, there was some uh, participation at the heads of state level. So at the, you know, the highest possible uh, political level for water. Um, significant representation from uh, civil society. Uh, as well. And um, uh, we saw a very strong presence of indigenous peoples, youth uh, representatives, and also women. They were much more visible than ever before. Uh, although, the, you know, there's always room for improvement in that domain, I think. Uh, and some people, there were some disappointments still, but, it, but I think the point is that we're, we're making progress. Um, the, the 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 fact that there were so many people there is really a testament to the huge appetite for water issues and a wake up call to the political decision makers that it, the time is now to pay more attention to this issue uh so um now that we've done that, I think maybe also there's a criticism that it spoke mostly to water actors. I think there's now a, a, a need to branch out and make sure that non-water actors are, are uh, uh, concerned and, and participating in these spaces. Um, for the conference as it was itself, there was the formal conference, but then there was also a sort of parallel track. So you had activities both inside and outside the UN, um, and it enabled interaction and 
partnership building in both of these spaces. Uh, and so, as we know, SDG 17 is directly related to partnership. And so this is a key to the success of the whole 2030 agenda. So I think that it was very useful in that respect. Um, in addition, uh, uh, there were over 500 side events that supported this partnership development, in addition to the, uh, to the, the formal segments as well. Uh, in terms of, of outcomes, so what we also saw is that there was uh, political leadership that was generated. Uh, there was the confirmation that there would be most likely a, a UN Secretary General Special Envoy for Water. Um, and the nomination is expected at least by September, maybe before. So why that's important is that you actually have a face that can provide visible leadership for water in other UN spaces and in around the world, actually, to make sure that we can raise water as a political priority. Um, in addition to that, it also set in place a valid model for political water leadership. Uh, and so it did that by the way that it constructed these five interactive dialogues. So within the formal part of the conference, there was there was the plenary, and then in parallel, there were these five interactive dialogues that were that were dedicated to very specific issues. And each of those interactive dialogues had two country co-chairs, one from a developing country, one from a developed country. Um, and so you have already mobilized, uh, countries around this agenda. And so uh, it is, uh, it, you know, we would we would like to see that those countries continue to sort of be the champions for water in those domain as they, you know, have the mandate to pursue this work further. Uh, and then also bring others to the table to make sure that there you know, are greater opportunities and stronger engagement for non-state actors and particularly the global South. Um, so that was a really important outcome, I, I feel. Uh, there, were also, there was also talk about establishing a UN scientific body for water that would be in some ways similar to the IPCC for climate, but have something like that for water to strengthen the me mechanisms across the UN so that water come, emerges as a, as a much stronger issue. Um, make sure that water uh, has a place in, in the agenda of each of the UN processes. So when we go to the high level political forum or we go to this, uh, to uh, any other number of UN conferences happening around the world, that, that there is a portion of that agenda dedicated to discussions about how water uh, contributes to those, those areas and how it can help achieve those goals. Uh, and most likely there will be another conference, follow-up conference that would be confirmed in the coming three to five years. So uh, we don't have to wait another 46 years before we can have another com uh, conversation about this. Um, I wanted to spend a little bit of time specifically talking about the water action agenda. Um, so you may have heard about this. This is a, a compilation of over 700 uh, and 50 commitments, I believe at this stage. Um, it includes significant financing and it, it, it creates linkages to these other global tar targets. For example, 50% of the, of the commitments that are in that agenda uh, uh, have some reference to climate change. So we know that that's a very uh, important interaction going forward. Um, we don't know exactly what the follow-up to that is going to look like, but uh, there are the UN institutions, UN Water and UN DESA, that are going to be uh, that have uh, already started working on what that could look like. And I believe that at the high-level political forum in July, we'll have a a, a better idea of um, concretely how we can make sure that that ad advances. Um, there's been some criticism of what of the water action agenda uh, because it, for for various reasons um, maybe you know some of which are that you know the commitments that are there they're not really transformational the commitments that are there they're things that people have already committed to so there's nothing really new I actually feel that the water action agenda is a hugely valuable source of information because it's the only place that you can actually go to and see a mosaic view of what people are doing 
on water around the world or what they intend to do uh, in the coming years. Um, and so with that vision, then it can actually enable more coordinated action by establishing various multi-stakeholder constituencies at different levels. So you can create smaller working groups that are working all together on the same issue and, and share and learn from each other how to push that forward. Um, and I want to specifically address what I feel is a little bit of a misunderstanding about the utility of this, of this action agenda. Not all commitments in the water action agenda need to be transformative, but some are, and that's great. But what I really want to say is that the, the content of the water action agenda is not actually the responsibility of the mechanism itself, but it's rather the commitments need to lie within the agency of the people that submitted them. So it's not like the 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 frame, you know, it's not like the water action agenda is going to change the way we do things, but but it provides a source of information and a source to create these 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 partnerships. Um, so if given that, uh, I would say what needs to be considered to a greater extent is not, you know, we don't have to monitor every single action uh, commitment necessarily. Uh, you know, every, you know, we don't have to know exactly where they're all going. Um, you know, it's not so much gathering all the information or making pe people feel bad about not progressing, but it's rather important to provide a platform where these different groups of actors can self-organize, where they can come together and meet and converge thinking over the long term about what their common goals are in that particular space. And we have to trust that that's going to happen if we give them the, the platform and the tools to be able to do so, because it's already in their interest. They wouldn't have committed to doing those things if they didn't believe that that was the right thing to do. So I would say that we need to consider more about supporting the action rather than monitoring the action. Um, so uh, I'm going to uh, move on to some some of the highlights and challenges that I feel are important to 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 share. Uh, so generally, like I say, I'm very optimistic and that's part of my nature. I have to be because <laughs> it's very difficult to do my job if I if I don't think it's worthwhile. Um, but uh, I, I think there are a lot of good things that actually came out of the out of the conference. You know, it wasn't all good, and but you know, <laughs> the fact that there were over ten thousand people coming in together to to talk and talk about this is already a good outcome. Um, there was you know greater recognition that water is a common global good, um, and also that water is central to climate change. For the first time, we had really important climate actors that came to a water meeting. I think that's also a sign of, of interest that this is important. Um, there was really interesting work presented, preliminary work presented by the Global Commission on the Economics of Water, um, which espouses uh, a, a very different approach to how we look at, at uh, the economy as a driver. Uh, and and holistic approaches to to these solutions. Um, we also need to understand that reaching SDG six is not about doing four times more things, but it's about being four times more effective or impactful. No with the things that we choose to do. Um, I believe someone needs to mute their microphone, but. Uh, uh, Please uh, all participants keep your microphones muted during the talk. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, so, so, so it's about be being uh, more conscientious about the impact that we're generating rather than just the things that we're doing, uh, and and being clear and transparent about that. Um, I think inclusivity is always a challenge, especially when you're dealing with UN processes, which are very much structured around member states. Um, so I would say that that's something we need to be aware of and, and make sure that the voices of those who are most affected by these choices are heard. Um, I think also there remains in many places a, a huge disconnect between global, regional, state, subnational, local, basin levels. So one, you know, there's this weakness where you have uh, a, a global framework and then it, there's a shift in the responsibility for the achievement of that 
that uh, framework to countries um, that is not accompanied necessarily by adequate or equitable means. Um, and it also supposes that basically all countries are working more or less on an equal playing field, which we know is not the case. Uh, so I think it's gonna be really important moving forward to figure out how to make these levels work better together so that we can realize these goals. Um, and not least of which is the, the economics of this and, and improving the financial flows so that the countries have the means to be able to do what they, they're, they have to do. So I'm gonna move now toward the awareness raising side of this uh, and what this means in terms of our shared responsibility for water, water resources. So as we've heard many times, water connects. Um, water is important to everything we do across all the SDGs, across uh, uh, um, all of the global challenges that we're facing. Um, and so uh, in that respect, our problem solving has to be holistic. We can't just look at things in isolation and solve one thing thinking that, you know, our job is done. Um, the second part of that is that we know that we can do more and we can do better when we actually ta tackle those challenges together. So that means reaching out to these other communities, such as those of health or food or energy or oceans, um, for example, uh, and um, those we know that those communities need water to be successful in what they're trying to do, uh, and so they need the water community to help them better become better stewards for water in their spaces. And we're only going to obtain the critical mass for this exponential growth and impact if we can get non-water people as excited about water as we are when we finally succeed at bridging those silos to foster a cross-sectoral cooperation through a systems thinking approach, then we're all going to benefit from these more robust decisions, policies, and investments that's born out of that cooperation. And to do that, we need them to feel welcome and comfortable in our spaces, uh, in our water spaces, if you like. Um, so there's an exchange that needs to happen. Um, and, um, you know, uh, for me, this, this sort of working better together means that we all ascribe to a systems thinking approach and uh, we plan complementary action across different time horizons uh, as our shared responsibility. Um, you know, we can't, we can't just sit around and look at each other and point the finger and say, oh, well, this is somebody else's problems or wait for someone else to tell us what we need to do. I think what we really need to do is design uh, a process through the Water Action Agenda and other mechanisms uh, to activate its follow-up together uh, rather than just say, okay, well, someone else is gonna tell us how this is meant to work. I think collective action is something that is spontaneous and ongoing uh, and uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be shepherded so much or maybe less than we think it does. Um, in order to do that, we have these long-term goals uh, that are very lofty, uh, very ambitious. And to make that more manageable, we need to divide that into smaller stepwise systems change uh, and sort of say, okay, if that's where we want to go, we need to back cast from there. What are the steps across time that we need to put in place progressively so that we can reach that in seven years time or 10 years time or 15 years time? Um, uh, and then once you have those smaller goals, then you can have those conversations about multi-stakeholder cooperation uh, to, to find a simplicity within that compl complexity. And we say, uh, you know, who can do what? Who can bring what to the table? Um, you know, we have a tendency to get overwhelmed and say, oh my God, these challenges are too huge. We can't possibly do them. Well, we might not be able to do all of them, but we can each do pieces of it. And so this is approach that, uh, that I learned from one of my uh, mentors, Deepak Gwali, uh, and, and he called them 1% solutions. So that doesn't, it means that not everyone has to do all the same things all the same time, um, but you can still reach your goal if you have a hundred different entities and they all contribute 1% of the solution. So I think that there is, 
strength in numbers, and this is the way that we should conceptualize our collective action around the water action agenda. So how do we keep the momentum up? Uh, I have already mentioned a couple of times collective action. So what does that mean really? Um, it, it, it is this trying to create simplicity within complexity. Uh, how can we self-organize into these more specific multi-stakeholder constituencies? Um, and, uh, and, and having the co uh, coordination mechanisms to sort of meet and converge thinking uh, long-term and short-term. And that depends on really strong communication. Um, and finally, there's, there's the accountability that people are actually gonna say what they are gonna do what they say they're gonna do. And uh, that we have inspiring leadership, but some of that leadership can actually come from us. Uh, all of us, um, as long as it, we have the means to get the job done. Right. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to pause there. Uh, just sorry, if I can just say one more thing. I think it's really important that we involve more women in the conversation because a majority of the planet's population is female, but women are uh, an untapped resource in terms of uh, solutions and higher level decision making and planning processes. So, um, you know, it's hard, it's messy, but it's not impossible. And we have seven more years to prove to the world that we can achieve SDG six. So thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, very good uh, ending note there, Dani. Uh, we've got some questions that rolled in through your uh, talk. So we start with Pooja, who, who asked, why did it take 47 years to have a new water conference? I'm not sure if you can answer that, but uh, give it your best shot. Oh, I wish I knew the answer to that. Um, I think it comes back to, uh, you know, making water a political priority. If it is, if it's not in, at the forefront of the member states' minds that this is actually enabling them to make progress elsewhere, uh, then, then you know, there there are other things that. Uh, uh, that take precedence. So I, I don't. I know that's not a sufficient answer. <laughs> no, but, but it's, uh, it's, yeah, and it's probably <laughs> true. Um, but now water has become more of a priority. I would say uh, also with the conference, right? Um, I'd like to think so. Yeah, yeah. And Puya also uh, asks, uh, what about corporates? How many corporates attended? Do we have a figure of that or a number? Uh, I don't have a specific number about corporates. I know that that there were some uh, that attended and also networks of corporates that attended like CEO Water Mandate, uh, uh, you know, different uh, uh, groups like that. I think that probably what from what I saw, and this is just an impression, um, a lot of the corporates engaged outside the UN space. So there were a, there were a whole lot of New York Water Week events that happened um, that were hosted uh, in private spaces by companies. Um, but there there was engagement. They were around the table uh, um, to some extent, but maybe they preferred to uh, to drive those conversations on their in their own directions. Right. I, I, Right, thank you. Uh, Ulrike says, special envoys, what is the difference to the work of the work of the former United Nations Secretary General's Advisory Board on Water and Sanitation? Wow, yeah. Um, that's a really interesting uh, parallel. I hadn't thought of about it, but uh, you know, that, that UNSCAB uh, board uh, dissolved some years ago. So I think maybe it did leave a void in terms of that high level leadership for water and sanitation. Um, and so uh, it's uh, an envoy is um, one person um, that has a mandate from the secretary general um, as opposed to uh, multiple governments. Uh, so that might be a, a slight difference, but um, it, it, you also remember there's there have been um, um, 
uh, special envoys for the for the human right to water and sanitation that exist. There have been at least three of them so far. Um, so you could also ask, well, what are the what's the specialty or the difference between those uh, those two uh, roles? And um, I think that perhaps an envoy uh, SG envoy would have a broader remit at, uh, that would go outside of human rights approaches, uh, for example. But uh, yeah. Um, I think the objective is the same to sort of raise awareness at the highest possible levels. All right, right, thank you. Um, another question, uh, another stat question from Ulrike. You mentioned women. Do you have stats on women attending the conference and in which functions? I don't have those. I don't have those numbers, no. Uh, I don't have access to the registration. Right. Uh, but, um, but, what I saw, uh, and this is just after you know, after 18 years of being in this space, is that there were there there was a lot more presence uh, of women participating and visible. Um, and there there were a couple mantles, um, but I think there were less than there were before. Um, so I, I think it would be great to uh, continue in that direction. Right, thank you. We move on in the question. We have lots of questions. We'll try to, to get them all to you. Uh, thank you, um, Sabine SS. Thank you. Wonderful presentation. How do we move towards empowering women in water sector on ground level as well as in high level des decisive roles? What was your impression from the UN conference on this particular domain? So uh, I think we could have a whole entire new webinar about uh, women's empowerment in water spaces at different levels. And I think that would be a wonderful uh, thing I would like to attend uh, and participate in. Um, uh, I, I know that there were events about uh, gender transformative uh, decision-making processes. Uh, I know that the ADB uh, Asian Development Bank uh, convened a very uh, high level session uh, about uh, about women's involvement and gender uh, empowerment. Um, it, it's it I, I see it sort of also embedded in a wider uh, discussion that happened around inclusion. Um, so not just women, but uh, Youth, for example, I think youth were, you know, I think it was the first time there were so many youth involved in the UN conference. Uh, I mean, the, this is, a, you know, historical from the UN perspective. Uh, and also, you know, voices from uh, from indigenous peoples and, and, and the like. So uh, I'm sorry, I don't have any specific information about that, but that's, let's, that's let's keep going. Let's keep going. Usman says, uh, I say water is life. Coming from the global south, I know what it means to have clean and safe and drinkable water. As a communication specialist, I believe we have a role in inspiring the transformation within the water sector and our work is pivotal. My questions to the special envoy, what are opportunity for collaboration and network? Would we know anything about um, how we can network and collaborate with special envoys or um, I, I, so the mechanism is not defined yet about what that function uh, consists of or how it would interact. Um, I would expect, because this is how the UN often uh, works with its envoys, is that there are opportunities uh, for stakeholder consultations uh, that are convened by this, the, the envoys. Um, and that there would be uh, moments of interaction, um, perhaps directly with that uh, with that person, but also um, if we look at these global processes as stepping stones to achieving our broader goals, um, you know we can look at uh, the HLPF that's coming up, uh, uh, which happens every year as a, as an important moment to sort of touch base and to to have those conversations. We can look at the COP. Uh, about uh, to have those conversations, especially as they per pertain to water and climate. Um, we can look at the General Assembly. We can look at the, the Stockholm Water Week. We can look at uh, other regional uh, events that are happening around the world and sort of how those things can, um, how we can bridge between them, first of all, to create this ongoing momentum. Uh, and I would hope that uh, an envoy would have those things in their agenda and be available to participate in in those discussions. All right, thank you, Danny. 
I know we have a couple of questions that we haven't been able to answer as yet. Normally what we do when this happens in, in our workshops, uh, we'll, we'll copy the questions, we'll send them to Denise, she will answer quickly in writing, and I will send out the answers to all of you. So no questions go unanswered, uh, but um, for the time, and we need to keep time, uh, we need to move on to our next speaker. Uh, thank you, Danny, very, very much for your contribution. Uh, super interesting to, to listen to that. And I think it was a good start for uh, the Water Communications it's a Workshop. pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. And now we're moving on to our next speaker, Vivek Shah. Hello, how are you? Hi there, very well, thanks. Yourself? Fine, thank you. Uh, I introduce you as communication specialist, Freshwater Ecosystems Unit at UNIP, United Nations yep. Environment Program. And you will give yes. us a better understanding of the CD, <laughs> SDGs 6 and the progress. Um, so I leave the floor to you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Gorel. Um, Firstly, allow me to just share my screen. Great. Are you able to hear me and see the screen? We are able to hear you and we are able to see your screen. Thank you. Super. Great. OK, let me start. So, yeah, firstly, thanks so much for the introduction. Um, as well mentioned, my name is uh, Vivek Shah and I'm the comm specialist for the Freshwater Ecosystems Unit at UNEP. Um, and uh, yes, I'll be talking about SDG 6 progress. So first, delve into this really exciting topic. I just want to sort of give a little bit of background on me as well. Um, my last sort of working on water and specifically in communications around water. And I think it's particularly so because like water touches upon such a range of aspects, be it from livelihoods and food production, all the way through to recreational and ritualistic rights. And it's therefore really rewarding connecting to people on its importance at a particularly emotional level as well. Um, I'm also involved in a couple of UN interagency task forces around water, so most notably a general communications task force and also transboundary water cooperation coalition comms task force as well. Um, and what I've really found is that there's a lot of collaboration and not just collaboration, but um, enthusiasm around this collaboration on water issues, which is extremely as important as we uh, need to gear up on accelerating action on them. So if we go into the next slide, um, with the growing complexity and the intensity of water-related risks uh, on the horizon, which include, but are by no means limited to, drought and depletion of water resources, but on the other side of the coin, too much rain and rising sea levels, which are causing a loss of life amongst communities and ecosystems, it is particularly clear that, say, that failing on water and sanitation undermines all three dimensions of sustainable development, being society, economy, and the environment but more widely, human rights, peace and security, and all of this is shown by the graphic in the slide deck. Um, a lack of progress on Sustainable Development Goal 6, which is committed to ensuring um, the availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all, as well as other water-related targets, can therefore threaten hard-won development gains that we see in other areas as well. And but yeah, conversely, effectively managing water and sanitation is an essential solution to tackling major pressing global challenges, such as climate change, biodiversity loss, food insecurity, and disease pandemics, to name a few. And these are priorities that governments and societies really care about. And as we can see on the screen here, um, from, the, uh, from the quotation from the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, it just shows how water is fundamental to sustainable development. So SDG 6 is highly interlinked and synergistic with many other sustainable development goals as part of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, with targets uh, encompassing freshwater ecosystems, drinking water, sanitation and hygiene services, wastewater treatment, water use efficiency, and integrated water resource management, again as shown by the graphic here, it is clear that Accelerated progress on SDG 6 can act as a catalyst for progress on other SDGs and vice versa. Progress on SDG 6 was also identified by the 2019 Global Sustainable Development Report as supporting entry points for transformation to achieving wider SDGs, be they on food systems, health and well-being, and also energy decarbonisation as well, for instance. But given this criticality of water, there's been a vast disconnect to the action which is currently being taken by governments and society to manage it sustainably. And I think at this midpoint of Agenda 2030, 
progress towards internationally agreed water related goals and targets, including SDG 6, are alarmingly off track. And what's really needed is increased cooperation and partnerships. And what we're seeing is for some indicators, the current rate of progress is not fast enough to close the gaps before 2030. And we're actually seeing that in some countries and regions, for some indicators, we're even backsliding somewhat. So yeah, in, in, in essence, swift and purposeful action is needed to change course and accelerate progress on SDG 6 itself. But while it's important looking towards the future and the need for accelerating progress, it's also worth considering what steps have been taken thus far in progressing on this SDG. So firstly, we have the SDG 6 Global Acceleration Framework, which was launched in 2020 as part of the Secretary General's Decade of Action to deliver on the SDGs by 2030. So this framework mobilizes stakeholders ranging from the UN agencies, government, civil society, private sector, um, to deliver fast results at an increased scale and around five cross-cutting and inter interdependent, what we call accelerators. These are financing, data and information, capacity development, innovation and government. And again, these are all encompassed on the slide deck as well. And within this framework, there are UN interagency initiatives to provide support for countries in accelerating this progress. Some of them are uh, include the Water and Climate Coalition, also the World Water Quality Alliance. And what they do is they bring together stakeholders to collaboratively inform on decision-making processes addressing water. And by operationalizing this framework, it's marked an important shift towards a more coordinated approach by UN Water, which is the interagency mechanism comprising of members and partners wor working on water and sanitation issues to deliver results collaboratively and together and with greater engagement, not only within UN entities and partner organizations, but across all levels of the UN development system as well. And when countries have adopted SDG global targets as part of the 2030 agenda, they're also committed to collecting data on these global indicators and custodian ag UN agencies were designated to maintain global data sets in order to track progress um, and ensure accountability. And therefore UN Water established what is called the Integrated Monitoring Initiative for SDG 6 at the beginning of the 2030 agenda to promote intersectoral collaboration and consolidation of existing capacities and data um, across organizations in order to strengthen countries' national and subnational monitoring systems. And since 2015, when the agenda was put into place, there have been two rounds of global data compilation, and the latest data uh, for each SDG 6 indicator is available on the SDG 6 data portal, which is linked on to here. And we can see in the graphic the latest stats and updates of where we are on each of those indicators as well. This, but the centrality of water's impact really came um, to the fore um, with the happening of the UN 2023 Water Conference, which was alluded to uh, and discussed um, in the previous presentation. So this happened in March this year. As was also mentioned, it was the first UN conference on water in 46 years. But what that did was it presented the world with a unique and timely opportunity to galvanize both political and also societal attention to protecting, sustainably managing, and restoring fresh water. And the success of implementations of the SDGs is particularly contingent on all stakeholders, be it governments, civil society, the private sector and others, coming together and collaborating to contribute to the realization of um, the 2030 agenda. So in this thing, the conference brought together world leaders, civil society, um, business leaders, but also young people, scientists, academics, and of course the UN system, um, and those from representatives from other sectors, including agriculture, energy, health, uh, environment, and water, all around this common goal of urgently tackling the water crisis and setting the world back on track to SDG 6. And some salient outcomes came out of the conference. Firstly, well, as again was discussed as this, uh, the Secretary General's announcement on the consideration of the appointment of a special envoy for water, which would help elevate water in the UN system. The second was the, the adoption uh, of the new UN Water Action Agenda, which comprises of over 800 commitments, which again were designed to accelerate progress towards achieving SDG 6 and doing both the second halves of both the Water Action de Decade, which was designated from 2018 to 2028, and of course also the 2030 Agenda. This has all been bolstered by um, the Secretary General calling for a quote-unquote 
quantum leap in the capacity of member states and the international community to recognize and act upon the vital importance of water to our world sustainability and as a tool to foster peace and international uh, cooperation. So following the water conference, the key question is how to translate commitments into tangible actions addressing water and deliver on this promise of SDG 6. And making good on these commitments requires stru structured thinking around three further questions. The first being, how can SDG 6 progress be put on track and accelerated? The second, how can the UN system help to support implementation and follow up of the outcomes of the conference, including, of course, the water action agenda? And thirdly, how can water be further elevated as a priority in the global political agenda? And this is where communications and advocacy are key in addressing these questions. Firstly, there needs to be inspired action for water and sanitation to drive acceleration for implementation of SDG 6. And this is where global thematic campaigns tailored for fast paced but also high volume communication contexts can quickly build public literacy and consensus around the importance of water and sanitation and also catalyze um, personal uh, and political action. The UN system in particular can help to drive awareness behind these campaigns and UN Water coordinates global thematic campaigns for international observances on fresh water and sanitation, such as, as we can see on the screen here, World Water Day, which is on the 22nd of March each year, and World Toilet Day, which takes place on the 19th of November each year as well. And these campaigns focus on different aspects of the water cycle, as well as the ways in which water and sanitation connect with other sectors. These campaigns have extensive reach on digital platforms to audiences throughout the world, so since 2016, the page views on the World Water Day website have more than doubled, and the potential impressions on social media have grown from 1.1 billion in 2016 to 10.1 billion in 2023. So really quite a jump there. And this showcases UN Water's strong social media presence. Furthermore, UN Water members and partners suggest the themes in line with current challenges which are being faced on the global agenda as well. And then there's also the UN World Water Development Report, which is produced on the same topic as those thematic uh, campaigns. And th this recommends policy direction to decision makers, and this holds uh, water as an elevated topic and on the political uh, agenda as well, in the same vein. But yeah, looking a little bit broader at elevating water as a priority, there needs to be an impetus to keep the momentum shown at the Water Conference of March alive at further big international moments. These could be such as the upcoming uh, 2023 session of the High Level Political Forum, which is taking place in July, the second SDG Summit, which is taking place in September, and then the UN Environment Assembly, which is taking place next year at the end of February. And what this does is provides and encourages world leaders to take stock of their national progress on water and sanitation and also take de decisive action to put water at the center of sustainable development and in the UN political agenda, particularly at this critical juncture, halfway point, uh, milestone to 2030. Moreover, positions such as the UN Water Chair, so that, rep that chair represents the UN on water related issues, um, as well as the Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights to Water and Sanitation. So this is the in independent expert on the issue of human rights obligations related to accessing safe drinking water and sanitation, along with the announcement of the consideration of the UN Special Envoy for Water, will do exactly that in helping to raise visibility of water-related sustainable development issues and will, will aim to catalyze engagement on the UN system, as well as across other financial institutions, member states, and other stakeholders. Through such steps, UN Water can help focus the visibility of water-related issues, but at the same time also mobilize stakeholders to take action on water because of the way that it underscores a variety of sustainable development areas, uh, as discussed previously, and thereby accelerating the implementation of SDG 6. But I think it's also really important to note that the strength of UN Water is contingent upon its members too, of which UNEP is one. And now we're going to do a bit of a deep dive into how UNEP's communications and advocacy efforts are mobilizing visibility and action on water-related issues. So UNEP's, water on, UNEP's work on fresh water connects to the organization's wider medium-term strategy, which recognizes three interlinked planetary crises of climate change, nature and biodiversity loss, and pollution and waste. Um, and the impacts of these crises are directly 
and in some cases disproportionately felt on freshwater bodies, which are essential for the lives and by extension the livelihoods and health of people, economies, and of course the planet. And when protected, sustainably managed and restored, these freshwater bodies are strong allies in combating uh, all three crises. For instance, freshwater bodies can help protect and restore biodiversity. They can also mitigate pollution through water filtration and purification, and they can contribute to climate stability by providing both mitigation and adaptation benefits. Therefore, UNEP's overall freshwater objectives and communication, freshwater communication objectives by extension, are to create awareness on freshwater ecosystems, provide information what UNEP is doing around freshwater, and therefore inspire, empower, and promote collaboration with, and also amongst stakeholders, thereby galvanizing action, particularly around those accelerator areas that were discussed before, so around finance, data and information, capacity building, innovation, and governance, and which all came out of the UN 2023 Water Conference. And we in UNEP are doing this through a variety of communication outlets and campaigns. Just as discussed earlier in the presentation about why I particularly love working in this area, one of the strengths that we really feel around communicating on water is that because of its tangibility and visibility, it's really easy for people to connect to water emotionally. And we can therefore sort of hold on to that and provide hopeful messaging around what can be done to positively take action on water related issues. And this is how we bolster our communications through these characteristics of water uh, in order to address our communication strategies and to raise awareness around those key international days of observance around freshwater and sanitation, but also wider ones such as World Wetlands Day, uh, which takes place on the 2nd of February each year. And now we'll do even more of a deep dive into some unit campaigns and advocacy avenues that bring about visibility to water and encourage action addressing water issues. One such campaign we have is around protecting, sustainably managing and restoring lakes. So fo following last year's UN Environment Assembly, which happened in, in February last year, a resolution was passed to request all member states to protect, conserve, restore and ensure the sustainable use of lakes, as well as calling on UNEP to advance mainstreaming and collaboration facilitation to members. And at the water conference, UNEP hosted a side event on sustainable lake management with support from the government of Indonesia. And this event provided an opportunity for speakers to share knowledge as well as experiences and best practices protecting and restoring lakes and all with that objective of garnering commitments towards sustainable lake management to advance the water action agenda. In preparation for that side event, we designed an accessible lakes portal whereby we provide information on what UNEP is doing to protect and restore lakes, but also give further information on how stakeholders can get involved to do exactly the same. And we also engaged with what we call a UNEP advocate or a goodwill ambassador who promotes UNEP's remit of work uh, more widely across their channels in getting that messaging across. In the case of this side event uh, on lake management, we engaged with one of our UNEP advocates uh, who's an Indonesian-Australian media personality, Nadia Hutigalum, to provide a video message on what she loves about lakes and why there needs to be a call to action protecting and restoring them. So what I'm now going to endeavour to do is play a little bit of the clip from that video just to showcase how exactly she got that messaging across. So let me just start playing that. And... So yeah, I mean, that was just an excerpt from the video um, talking, yes, exactly about why this advocate, why this unit advocate um, believes Lake's importance, but connecting more spiritually and emotionally around um, the benefits that Lakes provide and in a very personal way as well. And just for context, Nadia Hotiglung, this um, UN unit advocate, has over 850,000 followers on Instagram and 360,000 followers on Facebook. So what a great visibility platform to get that inspiring message across uh, is what we feel. Um, but in addition to lakes, um, UNEP is driving river protection 
as well as sustainable management and restoration around this water body as well. One way we're doing it is through a locally focused yet global initiative between, you, between us, UNEP, and Rotary International. The initiative is called Adopt a River for Sustainable Development, and its objective is to mobilize communities with support of other stakeholders to improve well being through the restoration of natural environments. And given the level of collaboration between stakeholders we're seeing there, there's a real opportunity for much communication work going for, forward to encourage further development of the initiative and partnership on wider issues, which could be, of course, restoration of those ecosystems themselves, but also solid waste management, wastewater, and mobilizing communities, particularly youth, for environmental action. This was all further showcased at the Rotary International Convention, which happened in Melbourne at the end of last month. The UNEX, if we go back to UNEP's lake portal, it's closely linked to a wider UN initiative called the UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration, which was then declared um, at the UN General Assembly that the years 2021 to 2030 would be such a decade. So led by the UNEP and the Food and Agriculture Organization, together with the support of other partners, this initiative is designed to prevent, halt, and reverse the loss and degradation of ecosystems worldwide, thereby drawing together political support, scientific research, and financial muscle to massively scale up restoration. And of course, with freshwater ecosystems being such a key ecosystem type, providing a unique habitat for many plants and animals, including one third of all vertebrate species, it makes total sense that this portal is nestled very comfortably um, within this wider UNEP campaign. And through this campaign, we're all able to connect to advocacy efforts in the freshwater space with other partners. So during the water conference in March, a coalition of governments launched a, what's called the Freshwater Challenge with support of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, the Secretariat of the Convention on Wetlands and others, including WWF and IUCN. This, is, this today is the largest ever initiative to restore degraded rivers, lakes, and wetlands. And we're now looking at how to partner with WWF on how to utilize this initiative to further drive awareness and action determining to protect, sustainably manage, and restore freshwater bodies. And UNEP's freshwater work also lends itself to other UNEP-wide campaigns, such as the annual World Environment Day, which took place actually just on, on Monday this year, so on the 5th of June each year. This year's theme has been beat plastic pollution as a reminder that people's actions on plastic pollution matters and to show to governments and businesses that the steps that they take to tackle this surge of plastic pollution are the consequence of this action. Rivers and lakes carry plastic waste from deep inland to the sea, so it makes them major contributors to ocean pollution. So protecting and restoring them is critical to addressing plastic pollution, and through communications, we can elaborate upon the synergy of water action to wider environmental crises. And in conclusion, we can therefore see that UNEP, and as being part and posited within the wider UN water mechanism, is utilizing communications to deliver on the water action agenda. So through the water conference, um, which showed the cross-sectoral nature of water, and the need to include non-traditional sectors, which historically haven't been involved in water management, you and water, uh, well, you and, and my engine, you and water, will need to make more efforts bridging these sectors. And therefore, communications and campaigns will have to broaden to better integrate into areas where water is not quite yet the focus of discussions, but also being agile to respond quickly to rapidly appearing opportunities. And what we as UN Water should therefore look into is the development of a UN system wide communication strategy relating water to respective mandates of UN agencies. And this could help strengthen the understanding of linkages with water and sanitation across other global topics of sustainable development, but at the same time also taking advantage of strategic opportunities of key moments on the global political stage. So that actually concludes the presentation. Thank you so much for listening. And of course, I open up to, to Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vivek. Thanks a lot. We do have some questions. And we start with Puya. How can local communities be informed about the water-related issues, problems, and solutions? And follow-up questions to that, is there a way to get the details uh, of the freshwater challenge? Question mark. Sure, thanks. Thanks for those questions. Yes, yeah, so I think, of course, local community action is incredibly integral um, to 
our water action that we're looking at. And I think looking through that lens of that one initiative, um, that Adopt a River initiative, where we work with local communities to protect and restore um, fresh water bodies is uh, an example of that. What we've done to sort of further um, that initiative is we've created a website. We've also trying to link it up further to social media, but we're making it as accessible as possible. Um, and going out, of course, to those communities. And then, of course, showcasing the work that we do with those communities through our communications work. And then, of course, taking that communications work and um, providing visibility of it at these wider um, and larger um, sort of a larger like political moments. So we had, of course, that Rotary International Convention last month. We used that as an opportunity to show our videos of how one could get engaged in that initiative. Um, and of course, a broad, a broad sweep into what that initiative as well. So I think it's, again, really sort of capitalizing on how we go on the ground, producing a communication app that, that sort of speaks to both those communities, but also vice versa to other more higher levels of a, a political rung, um, and then showcasing those opportunities at um, wider um, wider events of political significance. Thank you. And with, yeah. yeah. And sorry, just with regards to the fresh water challenge, yes, I can, again, I could provide a link to it, or I could provide, yeah, we have a UNEP press release on it, so yeah. I can put that in the chat. Just, or... just post, a, post a link in the chat, sure. that would be lovely, yeah. yes. Yeah. Uh, Buluwe Tito, uh, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, um, asking about the three questions you mentioned, Vivek, that mm -hmm. shows the importance of communications and advocacy. Can you repeat those three questions? Oh, you... yes, of course. Uh, yes, let me just, sorry, go back and the, yeah. So the, yeah, so the three questions that we really want to yeah, orient our communications and advocacy are around. So one- And uh, slow this... down when you speak, please. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. So the first one is how can SDG six progress be put on track and accelerated? The second one is how can the UN system help to support implementation and follow up from the outcomes of the conference, including the water action agenda. And then thirdly, how can we take water and further elevate it as a priority in the global political agenda? Thank you. Uh, Marissa would like to know if there's a website to see these campaigns and the material. Do you have a website to share? Yes, it's a, yes we love showing all of our material. So it would be the UNEP's water pages. Um, again, I can post the link. Post the link in the yes. chat so I, we get all, already... everything correct. I already see that Cecile's pro provided our press release on the Freshwater Challenge in the chat, which is great because that's exactly what I was going to put there as well. So great. That is one step ahead. Mm -hmm. We also have some just positive remarks, uh, no questions. I think the graphics and messaging were beautiful and impactful. We have a question here from Sabina. How is the uh, WAA going to be monitored and uh, water action um, agenda going to be monitored mm -hmm. and evaluated? Or is yeah. it also equivalent to the NDCs? How does the does organization like UNEP looking into mm -hmm. uh, monitoring and evaluation? Wow, yeah. so that will be the last question. And the rest <laughs> of the questions we'll take uh, just with us with Dani, we'll take them in writing and we'll send them all to you. Yeah, sure. That's a great question. One we're always trying to sort of see the how we can communicate around that data monitoring because it's so technical. But what's happening at the moment is we're doing what we call SDG6 data drives. So that's where we're going to countries, they're coming back, we provide them with tools um, and frameworks by which they provide us with the results um, of the extent of their freshwater bodies and the quality of them. And then we compile these into a report as well. I also mentioned the SDG summit which is happening in, in September later this year, this will be an opportunity to look at the results of these monitoring efforts at a sort of wider, higher level um, political moment. Um, and that will often, that will also open up the floor to sort of discussion in a more collaborative way across and um, on those, on those, on that data monitoring and also provide visibility of it. But yes, we work closely with countries um, to provide uh, data frameworks and data reporting tools. Um, and then we sort of ask for the results back to again, create that level of accountability. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Vivek. Uh, there are three more outstanding questions. I will uh, send them to you in writing. 
And if you can answer them just shortly, briefly, and I will then send out uh, all the answers to all of you participants um, in, in the workshop. So don't worry, every all questions will be answered. Um, it is now uh, time to invite the next speaker and all speakers. We are moving along in the program and we have uh, Iben Rasmin Östergaard Markusen, team lead WASH and early childhood development from Plan International Denmark. And we will also have Tilde Wildekilde, uh, external lecturer, Global Health Section Department of Public Health University of Copenhagen. Hello, both of you. Are you with us? I, I saw am here. You are here. Hello, Hi, Tilde. I Hello. saw I'm uh, also here. even before. Yes. Hello, yeah. Eben. How are Hi. you? I'm good. And you? Fine. <laughs> thank you. Um, we are going to talk about um, how Plan International Denmark teamed up with a research, research team from the University of Copenhagen. And this was to better understand your impact from Plan International and the need for youth engagement and so forth. Yes. And um, I think I would like to start with, this is going to be a Q&A for all of those listening in. Um, and I will start with the first question to you, Eben. Yes. So how did it start, the collaboration between uh, Plan International Denmark and the university? Yeah, well, I think we have uh, felt uh, within Plan Denmark a growing need to dive into our impact. Um, and then our um, our donor, the Grundfos Foundation, uh, had uh, positioned a researcher from the Institute of uh, Global Health at the University of Copenhagen in their board. And then through discussions, um, it was somehow initiated like that. So very much actually donor driven. Um, and then picked up by us and the university to uh, to start this uh, relevant and very meaningful uh, collaboration. Right. And and what were you hoping to get out of the uh, of, of the project? Yeah, lots of things. I think if uh, more concretely, it would be you know looking, of course, into our uh, program strategy and our implementation strategies to get new perspectives on that, uh, to find a space to have in-depth discussions about what are we doing, how are we doing it, and why are we doing it? Um, and then also, of course, for our tools and our methodologies and our surveys and stuff, you know, to have, have them look through and, and have them discuss to see if they were actually appropriate uh, tools to, uh, to be applied. Right. We are very busy in our uh, everyday life, so it's uh, rare that we find time to actually sit down and have these discussions. So that was what we were hoping for. Right. And Tilda, coming from, from the university and the academia, um, why did this in, uh, project, what, what was your interest in the project? Well, I've actually been a researcher in WASH for over a decade. Uh, doing research on uh, perceptions and attitudes and behaviors related to water sanitation and hygiene in uh, various low and middle income settings. So when the plan came to us and asked if we would like to be engaged in looking through some of their projects in Togo specifically, I thought it was really interesting, but also important because we rarely as researchers get the chance to to go and have direct communications and that just you know in depth discussions with the implementers in the wash community mm. so and I, I rarely get the chance to do that in relation to my own research so this was a golden opportunity for me i think yeah right you mentioned uh togo and that was your third party your your third party was the university of togo um and what were the benefits of engaging uh, a local university in this project as well yeah, I wanted to share the screen to show a picture of uh, our partners because that's absolutely right. I hope you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Yeah, and I'm just shifting to this lovely photo where we are all standing out front of the University of Lomé in Togo. And um, it was very important for us as well as for Grundfos Foundation to, to get a, a local research institute on board. Um, it, it has to be driven uh, locally and we believe also that it is the University of Lomé and the partners in Togo who needs to own their own narr narrative. 
Um, and as um, a civil society organization uh, operating in Togo, it is very um, crucial and relevant that research capacities that is needed to strengthen our implementation in the field is available locally. So that is actually what we were looking for, to have the researchers from the University of Lomé activated uh, in our implementation and do the same so that this is not something that needs to be driven from the global north. Mm. Well, well, also that absolutely true. And I think that was what you called also when we spoke earlier, you were talking about um, the knowledge transfer and the knowledge transfer in this, this project being so truly multidimensional. Multi can, can you explain that a bit? Yeah, I have a, a photo here showing uh, that every one of us is very deeply uh, integrated into uh, discussions that uh, is based on the data collection that we did in uh, the 20 villages in Togo. So normally, I think um, unconsciously, we are setting up project uh, collaborations like this to transfer knowledge from the north to the south um, unintentionally. But um, our experience in this project uh, and partnership has been that knowledge has really been uh, traveling across um, all dimensions. So all four partners who has been involved um, has really gained a lot. Uh, me personally also um, and uh, uh, Plan Denmark um, has gained tremendously uh, for this. We also had a study trip to Ghana, which is uh, right next to Togo, to uh, in interact with the WASH community in Ghana. And the, the knowledge transfer and the capacity development through that mission from Togo to Ghana was also wonderfully inspiring. So all this knowledge that has been uh, developed is not just sitting uh, in documents in, in computers, but it is out there living uh, mm. with all of us. And, and another thing that was very important for you in the project was to engage the youth. Um, and, and young people are quite rarely involved in research projects like this. And, and a couple of, of Togolese students worked uh, on data collection, uh, but also in the design of, of the survey. Um, so tell us a little bit more about your collaboration um, in this way. And, why it was so important to have the young people on board. Yeah, I also have to mention that we also had- Can you raise your sound a bit? Yeah, I, I tried. Okay. <laughs> um, I will speak loud and clearly. All right, good, thanks. I'm a lecturer, so I can, I can yell a little bit, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I have to say that uh, we, we did have Togolese doctorate students uh, uh, working with us. We also had two master students from the University of Copenhagen. But we also had a professor from the Department of Sociology at the, at the University of Lomé supporting this uh, team when they were, uh, um, when we designed the tools together, when we collected the data in the field and when we analyzed it later on. So in collaboration, um, we had these young people, uh, young people's perspectives, uh, and we also had the old, this more senior academic staff uh, being part of it. What is also interesting for me is that these young, uh, some of these young people here, some of them are not born and raised in rural communities themselves. They are maybe from the more urban setting in Togo. So for them, it was also interesting to go and meet young people in the more rural uh, setting and to have exchange of knowledge and experience there. Uh, so on many levels, they were uh, involved. Uh, they were also on the side doing their own research that was not related to our research but somehow they actually got inspired in their own research by this being a part of this research project. I believe we have a citation or two even we can show, yeah. So, uh, so for example, this young lady, uh, Viviana Sikbe, she's a sociologist by training, and she was actually learning new uh, data collection tools uh, in this project. We presented, uh, we, we actually applied a transect walk tool and she was inspired to apply that in her own research. And this um, Mr. Mintra Boudou, who is um, a ge geographer by training, he was also a part of the field team. And he said that it was actually a real eye opener for him to be 
to go to this rural community and be presented with the with the true realities of the of the rural areas in his own country right so so I think, and he says these are issues that go beyond my own research focus and I, he could use that, he can apply that. He's writing up his uh, PhD thesis now. So that is very inspiring to me as a researcher that we can actually, these young people can be engaged at this level. And there are more quotes here you can maybe- Yeah, read for yes, be because we were we were thinking about asking some of the, the uh, young researchers from Togo to join this, this program. Uh, but due to, to language barriers, we, we realized it wasn't um, feasible. But but you did go out and ask them a little bit about their point of view uh, regarding the the, um, the project, uh, like the greatest benefits of collaborations and what they've learned. And maybe one, one question that I always like to ask is, what surprised you the most? Um, and you do have some more quotes from your Togolese colleagues yeah, the top, there the don't you quote is really about what surprised uh, this young lady the most right so in this area a, a plan international has been building water uh, pumps and water systems uh, together with the Grundfos uh, foundation for some time and and we saw how difficult it is to change behaviors on the ground yeah so she was very surprised that even though they have water pumps and water systems things are maybe not moving so as fast as as uh, as as wished for. So that was her surprise, you know, why are people not changing behaviors? Yeah. Mm. And what was your conclusion? <laughs> well, there are many, many, many good reasons. I mean, people are not uh, resisting water, getting water pumps, right? It's important to underline that there are many reasons why it's difficult to change habits. That's the whole, uh, that's everything I do research about is about, it's centered around that paradox. Yeah. So there could be for example, old habits die hard, but there's also a very economic uh, aspect, right? Is they have to buy water and it's expensive. Um, so they have to prioritize, yeah? There's mm. also something about uh, maybe not maintaining water as clean as it could be when they transport the water from the pumps and home. Uh, so there are, there are things that people have to get used to doing. Right, right, right. Um, I also wanted to ask, um, or build a little bit on, on the innovative theme of World Water Week. And this is, in a way, a new way of building bridges between organizations and, and the academia. And do you foresee more collaboration projects like this? What do you think? Yeah, from Plan International perspective, we definitely see an increase in both collaborations with the research institutes and universities across the world. Um, but also building capacity in-house, setting up research and learning departments, uh, building bridges into academia. There is a huge need for finding out if what we are doing uh, is the right thing and what it is exactly that is working within the things that we are doing so that we can maintain them and strengthen them and then leave the ones behind that do not show high potentially impact. So I think it's a lot about Funding is less, we need to be accountable um, to, of course, our donors, but definitely also uh, the people that we serve in the community. So I foresee um, lots and lots and lots of, of uh, strengthened work um, uh, around this um, in the coming years. And Tilda, what do you think? Yes, we are actually now in the process of designing a larger project with these partners and potentially with more partners. And I just came back from Togo myself, where we had long discussions with the University of Lomé uh, to figure out how we can set up a collaboration. And there's great interest from all sides, from the university side, also from uh, WASH uh, networks, from NGOs washing, working with water management and so on, also from ministries involved in the water sector. So mm. definitely there's potential. There was one thing that we spoke about um, earlier, and I think you briefly touched on it, but I think we, we should underline also one, one important thing about this collaboration. Uh, you said about data collection, Tilda, and yes. when making surveys and um, the importance of, of actually not just collecting data, but collecting the right data and making yes. sure that your, the surveys that are done it's actually quality um, in, in the service and the question asked. Can, can you talk a little bit about that or elaborate on it? Yes, so in my time as a WASH researcher, I've seen, I mean, maybe 
hundreds of, of different types of wash surveys. And it seems that it's often the go-to data collection method for lots of NGOs or, or, or organizations working in the water sector. And, and the quality is really of a very varying <laughs> type of quality. So my, my point is always to say, you know, collect less, but collect smartly. Collect smart data uh, that will give you the right answers. Do not waste people's time to, you know, collect thousands of surveys in villages. If the quality of your questions is low, then you will just get more bad data, not more bad, not more good data. So actually, in this project, we tried um, to, to pilot test a variety of data collection methods, including qualitative or sociological methods. Eh? It's not very used very often by NGOs, but it really has so much power, I feel. So if you collect data strategically and you collect from the right target groups, you can get so you can get really deep insights into your the groups you are you are serving instead of you know collecting 4,000 answers from households that doesn't even, you know, really understand the questions you're asking. So really, I would encourage everybody to, to uh, explore uh, more qualitative, more, more sociological, more anthropological, and more participatory methods for data collection in the wash sector. Right, thank you. Uh, I have one more question before I let all the questions in uh, from the chat. Um, I wanted to know from you, Eben, if this project or the outcome of it, has it in any way changed the way you work or changed the way you are planning your programs or anything like that? Yeah, we are joking a little bit about saying that now we all are researchers now, like everyone is a researcher because it's somehow a change of mindset that you take on. Um, it is contagious to work with researchers. Um, so definitely all our mindsets has changed um, in uh, understanding better our context and what it is that we are doing. Um, I think with all this knowledge that we have gained, it is really an obligation to use it. We have all taken that on us quite seriously um, and to apply it into new settings. So it is with heavy weight that we speak when we say that we collaborate with universities in Lomé and in Copenhagen. So now it's us, it's also up to us as implementers or communicators or whatever it is to use those words wisely. So when we talk to Danish politicians or donors or um, stakeholders or whoever it is, I believe we speak with a different voice now because we have gained all this new knowledge. We speak with a lot more trust, I would say, um, and also, of course, applying our new knowledge across all the other plan offices um, that we're also working in. So it's not only Togo and Denmark who can benefit from all this knowledge, but we have really done a lot to um, disseminate knowledge and to convey it um, into uh, other um, contexts as well. And this has also been one of the parameters we set up for what is it that we are going to research on is also going to be very relevant for others because we don't want to sort of create you know, a silo with um, information that is only relevant for 10 people, for instance. Mm, thank you. Mm -hmm. So we have some, some questions in the chat. Uh, Megna wants to know, what was your reason for choosing Togo? Yeah, uh, that's a, a long history um, of a very old Danish NGO that uh, had um, sort of four program countries in West Africa being one of them. Uh, Togo being one of them. So together with uh, the Grundfos Foundation, uh, we started 10 years back um, to perform WASH projects in Togo. And as Anne was also um, writing in the chat from the Grundfos Foundation, that this is then an add-on to the implementation track um, that has been carried on in Togo for the past 10 years. Thank you. But maybe I want to elaborate a bit because yeah. Togo was also elected actually because the national wash policy in Togo is quite inducive for um, creating problems like this. For instance, it says that you have to pay for water and that you have to contribute your own um, resources into it and stuff. So there were some leveraging factors that we could build um, our project on. We had good uh, collaborations also with the water authorities from the ministry level and uh, down downwards to the department. So those were also factors who played in uh, back in the days when we started it. Right, thank you. I hope that answers uh, your, your, your questions, uh, Megna. Um, 
also had a question about uh, how the project was funded, but it was funded 100% by the Grundfos Foundation. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Um, we have another question here. How did the findings of your study inform your you and you and partners communications and outreach efforts? Yeah, um, we had a, a rather large uh, communication component attached to the research uh, project since it's uh, the first phase. We have been working together a year. We have been focusing a lot on the process and how we have been working together. Um, what are the steps we have been taking? So it has been a lot internally communicated um, how we are working together. Um, and slowly we are starting also to communicate externally we have produced a photo exhibition uh, with some photos showing some of the dilemmas and the consequences and the impact um, that we see from water being available or not being available in the villages in Togo that we will travel around with. Uh, we will also have some sessions during the World Water Week in Stockholm in August where we'll, we will uh, convey some of the messages. Um, we have had a campaign on uh, World Menstruation Day, where we also used lots of the data that we found um, to um, yeah, um, sp spread knowledge about menstruation. So those would be some of the, of the highlights, I think, from the communication things that we have uh, benefited from. Yeah. And, from and, and Afia side, would like to know, sorry? No, me, from, the, from yeah. the university yes. side, I can say that we also did uh, communicate uh, between the two universities uh, and actually our Togolese partners from the University of Lumé conducted their own evaluation report from, from their point of view that we then discussed. So there's communication happening at all levels here. Thank you for that contribution. I also uh, would like to, uh, also for the recordings, I'd uh, like to, to read out uh, Marissa's comment here. What Tilda and Eben are saying are critical, is critical every intervention should have a diagnosis based on expectations and action enablers, which we should use to create communication materials. Also agree on the methods to collect that data, yet not every project consider enough financing for this, nor for the communication strategy as well. Um, very wise words there. Would you like to, to add a comment to that, even or, or Tilde? but maybe with the findings and for, for the communications, because I think as always uh, mm. a thank subject that the, we discuss uh, a lot. I would just say thank you for the appreciation, Marisa. Thank you for your comment. <laughs> we, of course, agree. <laughs> <laughs> right, but then we move on to a question because I feel I want to like to know any plan to take such collaboration to Asian countries? Oh, maybe we would ask Anne from the Grundfos Foundation to see if she agrees on that. <laughs> I think Anne is here with us, listening yeah. in. Anne. I'm here. Yeah, sorry. I, I, I don't have a say about the money in the foundation, but oh, I think no. it would be interesting to to maybe uh, widen the, the, the research collaboration. Uh, we don't have that many activities in Asia, uh, but uh, but but again, we work through partners, so it would have to sort of depend on the partners, uh, bringing in uh, science partners to the projects. I would also say there are certain dilemmas around the water systems in Togo and similar uh, African settings that are uh, very, very conducive for some very important learnings. I mean, what uh, groundwater is diminishing very fast. Uh, the, uh, you know, the evaporation of surface water is happening very fast. There are some very critical um, uh, scenarios in these contexts that makes these contexts very, very important to place some research in, I feel. That would be very different in some Asian settings. All right. Thank you. Um, we we'll also have a comment from Sabina saying, thank you very much for sharing the details of the project. It is so inspiring in terms of partnership to someone from Nepal where we go uh, from certain mitigation measures without proper understanding of the ground reality of the given watershed, or sometimes in terms of technology and transfer, in addition to silent, pra uh, silent practice. Um, I do think that, that it says a lot about how much more we need to research, um, and maybe this bridge between academia and uh, organizations uh, and NGOs, how important that is. 
Hmm. Jurel, I don't I'm know if ask, you have are the time, but partners in Pakistan we can time. approach. <laughs> yes, you'll think about that. Sorry, Tilda. Jurel, we, we had one last slide with the one last comment we would like to make. I don't know if you can share sure. that. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I know this is a water water summit, water conference, but in the last couple of years, um, the water summit and water conference has also been concerned with other the other letters in the acronym of WASH, right? The the S for sanitation and the H for hygiene. And I saw some very interesting comments in the previous presentation about connecting emotionally to water. And I'm wondering here, what about the S and H in WASH? Why are they not? very heavy in WASH reporting. And this is like just a question going out to all the journalists sitting there and the communicators. And my own my own guess is that we don't connect as well emotionally to uh, to sanitation, waste and dirt aspects of, that are not very you know pleasant. But anyways, I, I feel that we should really remember the sanitation and the hygiene in the WASH concept. Uh, we, we need to put them at the center of research projects as, as well. We need to do more reporting about sanitation and hygiene because sanitation and hygiene are absolutely crucial for for life quality and well-being and and especially for health so uh, this is just a um my my wish my humble wish for <laughs> to all the for all the journalists out there thank you tilda and thanks for reminding me because that was actually my my last question to you that you had a special message for all the journalists and communicators out there um so just we, we have a, a couple of minutes um just all of you write in the chat um regarding tilda's comments here uh, why don't we connect so emotionally with the S and the H in the wash and what is needed to, to get more research into sanitation and hygiene? Just move move along in the chat and, and write your comments and thoughts on, on this. I saw tomorrow there is a session called Sharing the Good News About Water. So yeah. for, the, for the next conference, I would like to see a session called Sharing the Good News About Sanitation. Okay, I'll make a note of that. <laughs> no, I think it is very curious that we often completely leave out the sanitation part. Even in this project, we very quickly kind of slide towards only discussing water. Um, and of course, it's, there are a lot of stigmas and taboos connected to issues of and aspects of, of toilets, right? Mm. Because it's about human waste and fecal matter. Uh, but it is really important for human health to, to have strategies in place. I remember we also had a quote from this young lady in our team that she was surprised when she came to the rural villages, there were absolutely no systems in place for waste management. I mean, for, for no types of waste, for non-organic waste, for organic waste, for human waste, for animal waste, there are no systems established. Yeah? And that will eventually and very soon become a big problem for life quality. Yeah, and, human and I think we have to quite critical comments here one from Rebecca Gailunga our next speaker it's harder to see uh, it's harder to sell as people don't speak as openly about it yes and then from Magdalena a lot of stigma attached with sanitation and hygiene yes. uh, especially when we look at women's hygiene um, and I think those are very uh, true comments and, and I think we need yeah. to do a lot of work uh, to destigmatize uh, sanitation and hygiene, especially hygiene around women and women's health. But I have to say there's been huge, pr huge progress within the area of menstrual health and menstrual management. In the last five years, that that area has managed to be become very uh, mainstreamed and a lot of there's a lot of reporting on menstrual hygiene and menstrual management and menstrual well-being and that's great so it has just we just have to explore other other areas of the sanitation and hygiene sec, um, domain as well yeah not true uh we'll put some more sanitation and hygiene into to our next um program uh, maybe for 2024 uh, we will have more <laughs> sessions on that um, I just want to like to to end um, your participation here in the program with Gabriella's comments that we have to connect it with health, well-being and happiness. Exactly. I think that's an excellent comment. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Ivan and Tilda, for a contribution.
uh, we are now going to uh, move along in the program and we have our next speaker, Rebecca Lunga. Hello, how are you? Hi, I'm good, thanks. How are you? Fine, thank you. Connecting from South Africa, correct? Connecting from Cape Town, South Africa. It's oh. very rainy here, which we're not complaining about because we always love the rain. Yes, especially this time of the year. Yeah. Uh, Rebecca Lunga, Acting Head Adaptation Research and Performance C40. Uh, C40 is a global network of, of nearly 100 mayors uh, of the world's leading cities that are united in action to confront cl climate crisis. And um, I leave the floor to you. Great, thank you. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, so please do let me know once you can see it. Can you see that? Uh, yes. Perfect. Now Thanks. we see you and we hear you. Great. Um, feel free to stop me. I have a tendency to speak quite quickly. Um, so I'll try my best to keep it slow so that everyone can understand me and the subscripts can also come up clearly. Um, so thank you so much for this opportunity to have a discussion with you. Um, what I'll be speaking about today is very much in the urban context and how at C40, with the support of Grandfoss and the Grandfoss Foundation, um, we've been able to think about how we accelerate water action within an urban context. Um, so with, when we think about urban centers, we often think about how climate change impacts will be exacerbated there, given that there's huge population growth and at the same time um, cities are growing in a way that is sometimes unsustainable and um, that can lead to flooding and then extreme water use and um, issues around drought lead to water scarcity as well. So cities, we really understand them as systems that are facing a lot of interlinked urban water problems across the continents. Um, so whether it's water hazards around the issues of too much, too little or too polluted. Um, I haven't been a part of the discussions earlier today, so if I say anything that maybe already been said, um, please feel free to flag me and say, we know that already, um, and I won't waste your time kind of explaining something a second time around. Um, so I also gladly introduce C40 Cities um, as a global network of mayors. And really what our focus is on is how do we enable those mayors to support their cities with regards to climate action, both from a mitigation perspective and an adaptation perspective. Um, I'll only be speaking around adaptation today, um, but I am conscious that there's a lot of links between water and mitigation as well when it comes to energy or when it comes to um, treating water. Um, but for today, we'll just focus on adaptation and the urgent action that's needed right now. So in order to frame today's discussion, I thought it would be really helpful to take one step back and speak about it in terms of resilience. And so that's kind of how my conversation will be structured today or my presentation will be structured today. Um, I hope that's valuable for you. But really when we think about resilience of water um, and water resilience holistically, we think about it as a very complex system. But when we think about it in its subcomponents, it starts to make a little bit more sense and is almost always easier to communicate. So the first aspect is around um, resilience from what? So what are the water risks that we're facing um, that are likely to increase due to climate change and that will impose certain risks on people through disruption of their systems? Um, and then we look at resilience of what? So what is at risk um, from these water-based disasters, whether it's people or whether it's physical assets and infrastructure? And then the third one is resilience house. So that's really what we're trying to focus on here around how do we accelerate that action or how do we enable cities to be more resilient? Um, and how do we ensure that cities continue to function even when a drought or a flood does happen? So that has three components around identifying, preparing and transforming. Um, so as I go through the presentation, you'll kind of see these three themes pop up quite significantly. Um, so the first one, obviously, being resilience from what? Um, so at C40 Cities, um, we've done significant amounts of research into what are the challenges that cities are facing when it comes to water. Um, towards the end of 2020, we did research on the future we don't want, which was kind of the back end of, um, yeah, 
some of the IPCC work and really thinking around, well, what are the risks that cities are likely to face going forward? This one obviously only highlights drought and water scarcity risk, but we looked at it for extreme heat and for flooding as well. And to look at what is the urban population that's likely to be at risk towards 2050. Um, thinking very broadly around water scarcity, um, around two thirds of the world population could be under water stress conditions by then. So really starting to initiate the discussion with our mayors around, well, what is most critical to you when you're thinking towards 2050? A little bit of time later, um, we did research called focus adaptation. And that was really taking the next step, kind of saying to mayors, you now know what your risk is. What are the actions that your cities are already taking with regards to this? So once again, looked at all the hazards um, related to climate risks and really said, well, what is what we call now a high impact action that cities can take that's quick, that's easy, but that'll have a huge difference on the communities that they Im implement those actions in. So if we're thinking about something like drought, um, being based in Cape Town, one of the things that we really saw that was helpful and evident um, during our drought was communication towards the um, city and the community for them to have an understanding of, okay, well, how much water am I using and how can I save water going forward? And the whole thing around the Cape Town drought was the narrative that was built around it. I'm sure you've all heard of the term day zero. Um, and a lot of that was really, how do you, really capture what is happening that sometimes seems far away for someone who's going about their daily life. How do you make the climate impact and the climate challenge a little bit more tangible um, to communities? So we had this report that we produced around focus adaptation that looked at high impact actions and looked at them across the board, really mapping out the risks, but looking at it from a systemic risk perspective. So what needs to change in a city system? Um, and then also a building resilience um, perspective. So how do we address the actual hazard itself? Um, most of the time that I'll spend speaking about is our latest project, which is called Water Safe Cities, um, which we're doing with the support of the Grandfuss Foundation. And this started um, in 2020. And what we really started looking at was, well, how do we quantify the impacts um, of climate-driven droughts and flooding on the world? And then how do we effectively communicate that to a variety of audiences? So our outputs included interactive maps, infographics, and some of the storytelling narratives. Um, so I'll share some of those with you, but um, the links are in the presentation that I'll share. So hopefully you'll have a chance to go and look at how we address this narrative to some extent. So when we thought about quantifying the risk, there were so many things at play. Um, and I'm sure some of the previous speakers have mentioned how what is super interdependent on several other systems. So broadly, we knew we were thinking about flooding and drought, but also conscious that we needed to think about how populations are going to grow. We needed to think about how GDP could be impacted, um, how land is used, how energy systems might be impacted, and then also healthcare, um, which comes back to our previous speaker's point around the S and the H component, why are we not speaking about it? as much. And so we just touched the surface in this first part of water safe cities, but it was really thinking about if we can quantify the risk and then put either a dollar sign to it or a number of people to it or a number of hospitals to it, it really makes that messaging a little bit more tangible to the audiences that we're trying to get this message across to. Um, one of the ways that we did this was through building an interactive tool um, that really mapped all the water risks that our cities were facing, um, both for current climate and then for various climate scenarios towards 2050. Um, so at a glance, this might look really complicated and you're seeing, okay, well, there's a lot to read. But also, it's really simple for someone who just knows, okay, if I see a big circle that's red, it's probably not so good. If I see a smaller circle that's green, it's not good, but it's better than the big red one. So it's really around simplifying a message, but still getting an effective narrative across. So if I'm going to switch between two maps, just so you can see the difference. So this map looks at um, the cost in US dollars per capita per year of people that would be exposed to flooding. And this is based on a current scenario. And then if I jump to the 2050 scenario, um, you can quickly see how some of those circles got a little bit bigger, um, especially if you look towards kind of um, Southwest Asia. And what we really found for cities was it was helpful for them to be able to go and say, oh, I'm experiencing this, but look at this neighbor of mine or look at this other country who's also got a similar size circle. I wonder how they're addressing this similar challenge that they're going to be facing. 
Um, we did a similar thing looking at um, the costs that cities would incur with regards to all these risks. Um, also, once again, looked at the current scenario. Um, and here again, I want to just point you towards the North Americas and the Southwest Asia region and just see how from now until 2050, there's the significant shift between the issues that cities are currently facing and what they're likely to face going forward. And that for us really became a framework to be able to have more engaged and informed discussions with some of our cities. Beyond that, we then also built kind of narrative stories. So how do you make something that's very complicated a little bit simpler to understand? So when you say 26% increase in hydrological drought and water losses to equivalent to 16.1 billion meters cubed per year, that becomes a little bit hard for someone to grasp. But if you say that's equivalent to the Sydney Harbour drying up 30 times over, it suddenly became something that people could have a conversation about and be able to see how comparable it was to the context that they were going through. Um, so this really was building the narrative around what the research tells us. Um, next, I'll jump to resilience of what. Um, and so this is very much where we currently are in the second phase of Water Safe Cities. So Water Safe Cities 2, as we're calling it. And this launched um, last year. And part of it has a research component. And the research really looked at, well, what are some of the barriers and enablers that cities are facing going forward um, in terms of making this risk into an action? And so we're in the very initial phases of this research and we're hoping to launch it later this year, but really taking the stories that we're hearing from cities and our engagements and pulling out the key messages from it and building four easy narratives. So thoughts and information, engagement, finance and funding and governance. That's really easy for a mayor, a city official, a I suppose even someone who's kind of in the journalism field to just say, okay, these are four quick and easy things that I need to consider for any kind of water project. And our whole thing was, how do we take a very complex system and simplify it um, in terms of actions or things that people need to prioritize when they're thinking about enabling water action? The second part of it is our advisory assistance. Um, and that really looks at deep diving with a group of cities um, from across the globe. I mean, we have 97 cities that we work with. So ideally we'd be able to help all of them, but at the moment we're only focusing on five or six and really looking at peer to peer exchanges. So um, how are we sharing the messages between cities that have similar or even different contexts and how are we drawing on kind of these five high impact actions that we identified in focused adaptation um, to ensure that cities are actually taking the next step in terms of implementation. And then I suppose the last part of the resilience of what is really bringing it back to the people. Um, I suppose everything that we do, and we like to think that everything our mayors do is for the people who are in their communities. Um, but part of that is really what is the storytelling and the impact telling that we're doing. So this links back to our urban nature accelerator, um, which also has a big focus on flooding. And we really thought, well, what are the stories that need to be told from the local context? So we got our mayors to write letters to nature to explain how they experience some of these hazards in their cities. Um, we developed kind of campaign videos that actually went into communities. We asked artists to come forward and write poems or draw pictures um, that really animated, well, what is this resource? What is this risk? What is this climate change? What does this potential future look like to us? Um, and that was really great, both for sharing the message um, to a broader group of people, um, but even for us to think about, well, what is really getting across to people when we put a report out there that's maybe a little bit technical? What are the key threads that they're picking up on that they really want to build a story about and that will have the most amount of impact? The last part um, and I wanted to touch on was resilience how. So this is really how as practitioners, we take the next step in that we've told you what the problem is. We've told you who we want to focus on in terms of solving this problem. Now, how do we think about solving this problem? Um, our biggest thing that we're doing, working on as part of this Water Safe Cities 2 is our water accelerator. Um, accelerators within C40 cities are really focused on setting targets and quantifiable targets that cities can sign up to and say, 
I want to achieve this by this timeline and I want to do it with this cohort of other cities. And they basically then sign up to be accountable to us over the period to report every year on the progress they're making um, and then to showcase some of the solutions that they're coming up with with their peers. Um, but as I mentioned, it's really around the commitment, um, a political commitment as well. So it's made by the mayors, but the technical teams are heavily involved because they need to be able to say, well, yes, I think that we can practically do this. Once again, it focuses on high impact actions that cities are implementing and making sure that those actions are aligned um, with the Paris Agreement and the climate action plans, um, and then demonstrating increased capacity and really looking at, well, where are the partnerships that we can build um, with cities going forward? Why this is really important for cities um, is that it really took a shift in the approach and how we tackle the solution. So it's not so much around saying, okay, we just need to fix this water problem and everyone needs to increase their water um, availability by 20%. Our pathways are really contextualized. So we sit down with every city that wants to sign up and we say, well, what is your challenge and what pathway do you think is realistic for you and your context um, that will help your citizens or your communities the most? So that contextual part um, is really important when we're thinking of adaptation because no two city experiences are the same. Um, the second part is really that it's action and outcome oriented. Um, so it's one thing to say, I'm going to do this. It's a complete other thing to actually show how you're doing it. Um, so for us, it's really, we don't dictate how cities need to achieve the action um, as long as we see results from it. So we're not saying you have to have desalination, for example. Cities should not <laughs> prioritize desalination. So we're giving cities the opportunity to really think about how, or how can we best achieve the action for ourselves. The third area is around enhancing mayoral commitments. So given that I'm speaking primarily around the urban context, mayors are really at the forefront of leading some of this action in cities. And you can have all the money, you can have all the technical know-how, um, but if you don't have the political backing, we realize that it's really hard to get things done. And so as we think about the messages that we put out there, our question is often, okay, this needs to appeal to both a technical person, but also to the decision makers and the people who are actually able to advocate for this in rooms where maybe the technical speak doesn't sit for well. Um, and then the last one was really around how do we build capacity and increase the funding availability for our cities? Um, how do we tell the story to a funder? How do we tell the story to partners? How do we tell the story to communities to get them on board for stakeholder engagement? Um, and that's really um, what we're focusing on as we go forward with this accelerator. Um, another way that we're really looking to support this um, is through our Knowledge Hub. Um, so we have several resources available around that are freely available to both our cities, but also the, the general public that's really looking at, well, what are cities doing, pulling together case studies, how to reduce flood in your city, how to manage water scarcity. And we found that actually sharing that information um, in a way that's a little bit more open, a little bit quick kind of two pager um, is really practical for a lot of people that don't necessarily have the time to read a 50 page report or you know, a longer op-ed. Um, so this is literally one or two pages and it just pulls through key case studies and pointers for cities. So essentially, I mean, I'm coming to the end of my presentation now, um, but it comes back to kind of those three points that I raised earlier around the from, the of, and the how. And the how really pulled on identifying the risk. So how do we really communicate what the problem is? Um, the second part is around preparation. Once we've communicated what the problem is, how do we actually prepare people? So how do we strengthen institutional capacity um, and how does effective communication lead to adequate preparation for cities? And then the third area was really around transformation. So now that we told people what the risk is, we've helped them to prepare. How do we take it to the next step? How do we change the status quo and really enable cities to have an innovative approach to how they take water action going forward? So it's really around um, changing the narrative. And part of that is really focus on adopting a multi-level approach. So 
primarily seeing people as the beneficiaries. Our ultimate goal is to make sure that lives are improved. Um, and if that's not what the action is achieving, let's preferably steer clear of it. And um, the second is around the assets. So people first, assets second. So really around how we increase the production and make sure that people are safeguarded and protecting critical infrastructure, reducing damage. And then thirdly, around the capacity building and the building and the building advocacy. So how do we strengthen the institutions that we work with and really ensure the coordination and collaboration are at the center of everything we do? Um, so that is just a very high level of some of the work that we're doing at C40 Cities um, regarding urban water safety. Um, but I don't know if there's any questions from anyone. Yes, there are. Thank you very, very much, Rebecca, for a very interesting presentation. Uh, we start, Pooja has a first question. Uh, while we can see the impact of river and floodings across the globe, what are the solutions that have been identified to manage this? That's a great question. Um, so with NC40, um, we have kind of two primary, um, what we call high impact actions that we suggest to cities regarding urban flooding. Um, the one is really around sustainable urban drainage systems. And that's a big program that we're pushing with our cities at the moment. So really going into cities and thinking about, well, how are you potentially structuring the way you design your cities and working with the land use planning planning team to make sure that we're bringing in more green infrastructure into the city and not just relying on the traditional gray infrastructure. Um, and then the second area is actually around looking at reuse systems. So how do we see that flooding as actually not water that needs to be gotten rid of, but that could be repurposed or um, sent to a separate place and still have a beneficial use. So whether that's through rainwater harvesting or um, treatment, retreatment and reuse or gray water systems. And um, that's really something that we're focusing on encouraging cities and cities. But I know there's several other um, solutions that cities are implementing. So please feel free to share if you have suggestions as yeah, well. But, and those are, are very good examples, I think, of, of solutions. Um, Megna says, I understand Cape Town was under direct threat due to looming day zero, but cities like Lagos in Nigeria have currently, uh, quote, uh, unquote, sufficient water to survive. How do we mobilize government that considers water security to be directly uh, proportional to water availability? Also, like waste management has opened doors for people to earn money, which I understand is the reason behind its popularity, especially in Lagos. How can we inspire locals to better manage water in absence of a direct opportunity for earning income from it? There's two parts to that question, then. Thank you so much for that. Um, so I suppose the first one, and we have seen that as a challenge, and that's why we speak of drought and water scarcity, um, is there's obviously the climate component, which is like Cape Town had, where they went through a drought where there wasn't sufficient water. Um, but then we have cities, like you said, like Lagos, um, like Freetown, that have sufficient water, but it's either not of the correct quality or it's not getting to people um, the way it should. And so a lot of the work that we're looking to do is around um, working with their technical teams and really thinking around building water strategies that are a little bit more effective. And so saying, well, you might not have a problem now, but it's likely A, to become a problem, or B, you have a problem and you're not seeing that you have a problem. Um, so it's very much going in and having the discussions with mayors and technical teams and saying um, what you see as water in your river or in your um, lake or whatever um, isn't necessarily accessible to people um, right away. And if it is accessible to people, it's not always of an adequate quality. So we really need to rethink the approaches that we're having and take a more strategic approach, especially in a city like Lagos where population is increasing very rapidly. Um, they need to start thinking about the necessary infrastructure to be able to provide for populations going forward. Um, and then the second point was on waste, and I suppose more in informal sector. Um, and I'm assuming this refers to um, waste management so that water is not polluted, um, correct? Okay. I, I'm gonna okay yes, I think so. Don't okay. get any reaction, but we think so. Yeah. Um, so some of the work that we are looking at um, is we have a specific team within C40 that's focused on waste management, more from a mitigation perspective. But we've started a lot of collaboration with them around um, 
with our flooding team and that waste team around, well, how do we really rehabilitate some of these water courses so that we're thinking of the downstream users um, in terms of these water sources, um, but then also from an informal sector perspective in terms of creating income, um, that's something we haven't yet explored. So um, thank you for raising that because we realize there is a lot of kind of um, informal economies going on when it comes to water, whether it's through, you know, less formal um, decentralization of distribution and things like that. So that is something that we think is a priority that we do need to think about, well, how do we decentralize some of these systems that don't necessarily need to be managed in one place by one person? Um, because as communities start to spread out, and especially in the global South, where there is a little bit more informality um, within the urban context, it's really critical to think about how can we get water to these people quickly? And when there is a flood, how can we get that water out of those communities quickly? Thank you. Uh, we also have a question from Marissa. Um, Rebecca, day zero narratives are more associ associated to negative feelings. Therefore, how do we change to a more positive narrative? Yeah, that's a really good um, question. And I guess being in Cape Town, it was a bit of a, a fear narrative. Um, and that was really what got people moving in terms of they were like oh wait this is going to be a big problem um I think for us what we found especially in our campaign for um urban nature was really telling the impact story um so finding cases of where things have worked well or really bringing it down to this person in this community is telling their story and yes your story might not necessarily look like theirs but there is a personal um a personal relation that happens where you can resonate with an individual's experience. Um, and so a lot of the narrative building that we're doing now is more around showcasing where things have worked effectively versus um, building the case for things that aren't working. Um, it is a little bit slower in terms of people aren't shook scared into action, um, but I think it has a little bit more of an ingrained impact for people. Um, if I think about Cape Town now, people are watering their gardens again, people are taking longer showers again, the day zero narrative, because day zero never happened, they're like, oh, it's fine, you know, it's not a problem. Whereas I still remember um, seeing someone, you know, buying five bottles of water and giving two to their neighbor. And that was more a case of, okay, that was a problem and they obviously needed to solve it by um, buying water from the shops, but that lasted longer with me than thinking about the day zero conversation and thinking about measuring 50 liters of water. Um, so it's really switching the narrative from things are going wrong to, okay, what is going right that can stop this disaster from happening? Yeah, and, and we are, thanks for that. We, we are going to focus quite a lot on, on solutions driven journalism and reporting and, and communications and well throughout the program. Uh, so, so I think it's, important i wanted to ask you if you do have like some of these cities that you're working with some really good examples um for where things have gone right yeah there's plenty <laughs> um i mean off the top of my head now um we we've done some work with phoenix um and their whole thing at the moment is they're really working on, on partnering with the private sector and thinking about, well, how do we change the narrative around the concept of a 50 liter home and how do we make it so mainstream that it's almost, there's no alternative that everyone expects that, oh yes, of course my washing machine or my dishwasher is efficient. And that partnership with the private sector has been really like beautiful to see evolve um, in terms of um, Phoenix looking at alternative ways to reduce their um, water consumption, but also taking that message to a household level. Um, and then another great one that we worked on recently um, is in Santiago, and um, they're really starting to think about, well, how do we um, change some of our flooding measures and really implement kind of more green solutions. And so we had engaged workshops with the city of Sao Paulo, um, who was able to kind of come in and say, well, this is what we're doing around in bringing in nature-based solutions in order to reduce flooding. But really that sharing of experiences with cities and um, building a network around that um, has really been valuable in some of our regions. Um, and it's really what we base a lot of our 
work on water around. So kind of building the network and making sure that those experiences are shared and those stories are told. Um, I could go on. Um, yes, obviously we, but have we, we are running out of time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, Thank you. It's, it's well, also been in the comments how important it is to, to actually share uh, experience and, and good stories and, and best practice just with uh, uh, our previous speakers, I would like to, to end um, your session here with a comment from Monica saying, thank you, Rebecca, for repeating, uh, telling the story. So often scientists believe that if we give people all of the data on a topic, they will suddenly care about it. But it's the individual stories that change people's attitude. And I think it's, it's a very good comment. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, a lot of uh, claims here in the chat box. Uh, thanks, Rebecca.